men. I'm coming as fast as I can. Let's see. How long, how long does this spot usually go? How many minutes? 40, 45 minutes. Do what? About 45 minutes. All right, I'm going to try to keep it away. You've got a shoulder if you want. Yeah, great. Really. Right. <laughs> I don't want to get cow Nehemiah chapter 6. It's good to be here tonight. And uh, I'd rather be here, to be honest with you, than the nicest jail in Mexico. <laughs> they got some nice ones. And I'd rather be here. Amen. <laughs> and uh, it's good to be with the Lord's people. And if you've been some of the places that I've had to be, you'd be glad to be here too. But uh, I thank God for His mercy and His grace. And that's all I've really got to claim tonight is uh, just the grace of God. And uh, I guess if you're here, that's all you've got to claim too. Amen. 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 Sing a little bit of this, I believe. Two coats were before me, an old and a new. I could have either, so what would I do? One coat was dirty and tattered and torn, but the other was a new one, it had never been worn. And I'll tell you the best thing that I ever did do. When I laid off the old coat and I put a new Amen. Now my new coat, it fits me and it keeps me so warm. It's good in the winter and been good through the storm. My Savior has clothed me in garments so rare. Wherever that goes and it says, and then it's give me a child bear. <laughs> But I'll tell you the best thing that I ever did do When I laid off the old coat and put on the new Amen. 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 And I thank God for the new coat that He gave me. And there was a lot of time, I spent a lot of time in the world. I got saved when I was a little boy, just about four years old. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. And that's, that's all it takes is just somebody coming to Him as a child. And you ask Him to come into your heart and save you. And Time went on, and man, I got a little shaky in that, and I, I just asked him again. Amen? <laughs> Made sure of that. Thing. But I thank God he saved me when I was a boy, and I was raised in a preacher's home, and I started preaching, believe it or not, when I was about nine years old, and surrendered to preach up in North Carolina at a camp meeting, and I preached for about five years, and, and tried to be faithful to the Lord and do what he wanted me to do, and uh, the Lord opened doors to go places and preach and try to do something for him. And then when I was about 15 or so, or just before I turned 15, all hell just came against my home, and the devil just, I mean, really showed up real strong. And I don't blame anything that I did on anybody else, but really it made it real easy. And I, and I got out in the world and got away from the Lord for about nearly five years. And, but I thank God when I was 19, just before I turned 20, the Lord got to calling me back. And that's exactly how He does, because that's, that's, that's His grace and mercy, brother. And the Bible says His mercy is new every morning, yeah. and His grace, it never runs out. It don't matter what yeah. you've done or where you've been. Yeah. The grace of God can reach the lowest, vilest sinner that's ever been. Amen? Yeah. And I thank God that when I was 19, September the 26th of 2003, brother, He got to dealing with me, and I just laid out prostrate on my bed, and I told the Lord, if you take me back and let me preach again, I'll do anything that you want me to do. I don't care about making a fool out of myself. It don't matter. I don't care about prestige in this world or prestige with man. That don't matter to me, brother. I just thank God that He took me back, and it's His approval that I'm seeking now. Amen. And I'll tell you what, the best thing that I ever did was take off the rags of my sin and put on the new coat. Amen. 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 That is not what I'm going to preach about, but I just felt like that. I wanted to sing that little song. I ain't, I ain't heard it but about two weeks. Uh, Danny and Dee Dee Hall sang that song. And uh, I've been listening to it a little bit. And I don't even know all of it, but I like it. Amen. I like the parts I do know. But uh, Nehemiah chapter 6. Now, this will be real familiar. I thought I was going to preach something else, and I had something. I had a sermon laid out, man, and it was brand spanking new, and it was, I thought it was going to be so good, and I thought I'd like to 
send a copy of that into the sword of the Lord. <laughs> but I couldn't even sleep Wednesday night. The Lord wouldn't let me preach that. He, he had it on me so strong to do something different. And I think this is what He wanted tonight. This is real simple, and this is a story that all of us know. We've all heard this our whole lives. If you've been in church any time at all, you know the story about Nehemiah. But I'm going to try to... Uh, preach it again to you and maybe you'll get something a little different, hear something a little bit different out of it tonight and it'll be an encouragement to you. Uh, it's always good to hear these stories again. Amen? They never do get old. But Nehemiah chapter 6, the Bible says in verse 1, Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard uh, that I had built the wall. And y'all know the story up until now when Nehemiah gets called by the Lord to build the wall and that there was no breach left therein. Though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates. Then Sanballat and Geshem uh, sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. And I guess that's how you say that. That don't sound like a good place to be when you're in Ono. But anyway, but they thought to do me mischief, he says, and I sent messengers unto them, saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Uh, yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd touch me tonight try to preach God, and I pray, Lord, you'd be with these other preachers here in a little bit. Lord, that there'd be liberty and unction in this place to preach, and God, I ask you for your power. And Lord, I pray, Lord, if there's somebody here that's struggling, or Lord, will be, in the next few months, Lord, that this message would find a lodging place in their heart and the Holy Spirit of God would bring it to their remembrance. And Lord, that there might be something said here tonight, uh, Lord, that would encourage somebody. And I just pray that everything said would bring honor and glory to you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm going to drink a good bit of water while I'm preaching. And I'm being serious about this. I went to the throat doctor and he told me, he said, if you're going to preach, then you're going to have to keep your throat wet the whole time you're preaching or you're going to lose your voice. Because I've been known, I'm from Alabama. I mean, Alabama. I surrendered to preach in North Carolina, and I'm from Alabama, and I'm a, a, a Bible Belt preacher. I, I like it if a man works up a sweat while he's preaching. Amen? I mean, really, when I came up in there, they said, you know, if you ain't broke a sweat, you ain't done nothing yet. So, uh, you know, so y'all just bear with me just a little bit, if you would. I know some of y'all from up north, and y'all do it a little different. But y'all just bear with me if you wouldn't. He told me you're going to have to drink a lot of water. And to be honest with you, I personally never really like to dry preacher anyway. So I'm going to drink a lot of water. <laughs> Don't let that distract you though. But now we look at this story of Nehemiah and he starts talking here and we pick up right here in the middle of him building this wall. And I want to show you just a couple of things right here. Turn back just to chapter 2. Look what the Bible says right here in Nehemiah chapter 2. I want you to notice this about this wall that he was building. He says, uh, Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 12 says, And I arose in the night, I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Now, we, when we read this story, we'll find in chapter 2 verse 18, he refers to it as a good work that he's doing. And over there in chapter 6 verse 3, he refers to it as a great work that he's doing. And let me tell you this tonight, it doesn't matter what it is, and the Bible also says that God put it in His heart to go back and build the wall. He didn't just take it on Himself and say, I believe that I'll go back and build the wall. But it was the Lord God Almighty that put it down in His heart, and He said, I want you to go back to Jerusalem, and I want you to build the wall back. He refers to it as a good work that he was doing. He also refers to it as a great work. And let me tell you this tonight. Whatever it is that God has called you to do, it's a good work and it's a great work for the Lord. Amen. It doesn't matter how many people um, how many people know you and how many people say, well, this guy's a good preacher or this lady's a good singer. Or, Boy, she's going to make a good preacher's wife. And all. That doesn't matter at all. What really matters is, has the Holy Ghost of God put a work down inside of your bosom? Amen. And if He has, it doesn't matter about numbers and it doesn't matter about fame and prestige. What really matters is, is you're doing a good work for God if you're doing what He put in your heart to do. Amen. And that's what really matters. Some of you say, well, Brother Jared, He's put it in my heart that I need to go to Bible school. 
then that's a great work for God. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. If that's what He's put in your heart to do, just like He did with Nehemiah here, if that's what He put in your heart to do, then you purpose to do it. Amen. You say, Brother Jared, I'm called to be a foreign missionary. Well, that's a great work for God. I'm called to be an assistant pastor somewhere. That's a great work for God. There'll be a lot of people that try to downplay certain areas of the ministry. You ever heard that? I'm serious. Sometimes people make you. There may be men in here tonight that you ain't never been called to preach. Don't you feel bad that you ain't been called Amen. to preach? Amen. Amen. I've had guys tell me before and say, you know, man, I just I ain't never been called to preach, and I don't know what I'm gonna do, and I, uh, Lord, ain't never called me to preach. And you can get like that if you're surrounded by a bunch of preachers. You start thinking that you need to be preaching. You might know what I'm talking about. Well, I need to be preaching too. I mean, I, I, I listen, if God ain't called you to preach, you ought to jump up and down and click your heels and shout all over this place, man. I'm serious. That might mean that you ain't part of the base or sword. Amen. I'll get compliment to you. Hey, whatever it is that God's put in your heart, it's a great work for God. Amen. Amen. There are several reasons. I believe, brother, that people, they get, when they start working on whatever it is, the work that God's put in their heart to do, whatever it is, and it don't matter what it is, because that's between them and God. Whatever it is, there'll be times when men want to come down off the wall. They want to stop working on whatever it is. If the next phase of your journey through this thing is to go through school, if that's the next phase, then you just purpose in your heart that you're going to do it. Amen. And don't don't come down to you. That's right. Don't come down. I mean, several reasons. One of them be discouragement. People come down just because they get discouraged. You ever been around somebody that's discouraged in the ministry? I mean, it's an awful thing when you get around a preacher that's just he's just 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 messed up with discouragement down in his heart. And I've seen ones that come down because of doubt, because they think that God won't be able to take them through this thing. I've seen men that that get upset and come down. I've been talking to one just the past few months that is just a pastor. He's in his 40s and he's been pastoring for years. And he called me and he said, he was crying and he said, you got to pray for me, brother, because I'm going through such depression that I don't know what to do. Some of you in here tonight, you may laugh at that. And you think, oh, just depression, man. He ought to just, he ought to just pull himself up by his bootstraps and keep on going. That sounds good, buddy, until you get hit with it. Yeah. It's real easy to be talking about what somebody else needs to do. But I'll tell you what, when you get out into the work of God, or some of you's already experienced it, there's going to be many times when you want to come down off the wall. It may be doubt, it may be uh, depression, it may be just disgust with the brethren. Anybody ever got disgusted with the brethren? I have, buddy. And I'll tell you what, it'll make you want to come down and quit the work for God sometimes out of just pure disgust. There'll be times when you want to come down especially young men, young ladies, because of desire. There'll be some kind of fleshly, lustful desire in your heart that'll make you want to come down off the wall. Talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Sometimes when you're up there building, you know this happened when they was up there building that wall, building that thing and trying to get this thing going, trying to build this thing, stacking these bricks. There's going to be times when they dropped a brick. You ever thought about that? They didn't always land in the right spot. There'd be times when somebody was carrying some mortar around there and they spilt that bucket of mortar. There's going to be times when just pure be out defeat makes you want to come down. You ain't going to win every battle that you fight. Amen? Anybody with any age on them at all ought to know that by now. You won't win every single battle. And there's times when you go through times of defeat where it's going to make you want to quit and give up all together and throw the towel in. Make you want to come down off the wall. Several reasons why people want to come down. But I want to give you a few things tonight on why Nehemiah, I believe, couldn't come down. We can uh, liken them to ourselves here. See ourselves in this. And I ain't going to preach very long. You said, what, I had an hour and a half? And then other guys were preaching. Listen. I want to say this. Listen to me. You can't come down. Nehemiah couldn't come down because there was an example being set. Notice right there what he says in chapter 6, verse 3. He says, And I sent messengers unto them, saying, And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I'm doing a great work. See, there was a lot of people who thought it was stupid. Did they not? 
there's going to be people that think whatever God put in your heart is something stupid. But he said, I'm doing a great work. How do he know that? Pretty much everybody else was against him. The Lord had put it down in his heart. He said, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Notice what he said. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? See, there's a pile of men working on this wall. Are you with me? That baby's with me. That's fine. That's what I'm talking about. Some of you men can't say amen. That baby. There was a pile of men working on that wall. Was there not? It was a big job. It was a good work, but it was also a great work. I mean, it's a big, big project. There was a lot of men working on it, but he said, I can't come down to you. Why should I come down to you and the work cease? So, well, he would just come down and talk to him for a little bit, but the work never really ceased. See, he knew because somebody else was watching to see what he was going to do. That's right. And if he come down, the work would cease. That's right. Amen. I'll tell you what, if you see it or not, it doesn't matter how young you are. If you've been saved, I'm going to say if you've been saved for three years, somebody is watching you. Yeah. You're setting an example for somebody. That's right. Amen. Somebody's watching you. You say, well, I'll never be, and I'm not a man of influence like Nehemiah. I'm not a man of influence like Dr. Rudman or Brother Donovan. But hey, I'll tell you what, you may not see it, but you are influencing somebody That's with right. your life today. Amen. And I guarantee you this, if you come down and you quit, there'll be somebody, they may not quit, but buddy, it sure will knock the wind out of them. That's right. Amen. There was a big preacher just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, the pastor up in Hammond, Indiana, and uh, some of y'all already know what I'm fixing to say. Just a couple of weeks ago, I got word that that guy pastored a big mega church, the 11th largest church, independent Baptist church in America. 15,000 members in that church, and they had preached the truth for years and years, and we don't line up on everything, and I know all that, but them people still up there winning souls. Amen? Amen. Hey, I'll tell you what, if somebody's a soul winner, I'll tip my hat to them, buddy. I may not agree with them on everything. We may not cross every T and dot every I just a lot, but I just I appreciate what they're doing. Amen. 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 But that fellow up there, I got I got a fellow told me I was in a meeting uh, in North Carolina a few weeks ago, and a pastor told me sitting across his kitchen table. He said, "This is a guy now. By the way, he used to pastor Jack Howell's church. He's a guy that took Jack Howell's church." And that man told me he said. The man that I'm fixing to tell you about is the guy that took Jack Hiles Church. He said that fellow, he'd been pastoring there for years, maybe 10 or 12 years now. And he said that fellow that a deacon found his phone, he laid his phone down and a deacon got his phone, and his phone had a picture of him with a 16-year-old girl, and they were kissing each other or something like that on the telephone. And that man was married, and he was a pastor, he was 54 years old. And that man, the deacons went to him, you know, the church came to him, and of course he's put out of the church now and you know and it's funny let me just say this it's funny how they never went in and reported how many people got saved on a given Sunday but you can find news reports about it about this preacher that messed up when it fell in the sea amen. Right. Amen. amen but that fellow I got to thinking and I'm not I've never been a fan of that particular preacher he's independent Baptist a little different stripe than we are and all that he is a soul winner, and then, you know, and he said a few things about the King James that I don't agree with, and all that. And we ain't just alike on everything. But I'll tell you what, I appreciated the work that he was doing up there, brother. At least he was trying to win somebody to God. At least there was men that watched him go out and try to win souls, and then try to follow him and go win souls. You know what? If stuff like that, if you hear something about somebody going down, and it kind of excites you a little bit. You think, yeah, I knew that joker. Or, yeah, I, that guy, I'll tell you, I know why he went down. Something's wrong with you. If you get a kick out of some preacher falling into sin, then at least he's pretty right on stuff. And you get you get some kind of a kick and a thrill out of somebody falling into sin, your heart is not right with God. Amen. I'm just throwing that in there. I ain't even going to charge you for that. But your heart's not right. Listen, you say, well, how'd you react? When I heard that, I was sitting at that guy's table, I just busted out crying. And I ain't never liked to hear that guy preach. I ain't never had nothing for it. But you know what upset me? What I got thinking about? Is there somebody somewhere, there's an 18-year-old boy somewhere in America that surrendered to preach when he was about 13 or 14. And he's got every sermon that that preacher ever preached. That's right. He listens to him on his iPod. And that's his hero. 
And he's read any material that he's got. And he thought, man, that guy, he's my hero. And man, I'm 18 years old now. This is all I've ever wanted was to go to school up in Hammond. And I wanted to learn the Bible. And I wanted to learn how to preach underneath my hero. And I wanted him to teach me. And he was going up there and he was thinking, man, when I get there, maybe he'll sign my Bible. Or maybe there'll be a time when, when maybe just within the four years I'm there, I'll get, to, I'll get to sit down and have a meal with him. Who knows? And that kid's parents had to call him in. He came in somewhere. This is hypothetical, but this stuff's true. Amen. This stuff happens. Amen. His parents had to call him in and say, listen, brother so-and-so, I know he's your hero, son. I know he's been your, the, the man that you've idolized for the last five or six years. He ain't even up there at the church anymore. He's done a fellow to sin, running around with this girl, and they put him out of the church. Man, it breaks my heart to think about the news that somebody got about their hero going down. Amen. You say, why is that? Listen to me. You might not have ever been through nothing like that, but from about the years of 12 to 14, I got that call an awful lot. I don't know what happened. It was like some kind of an epidemic swept through, and my hero started dropping like flies men that I idolized and I loved them. They were my hero. Just started dropping like flies. And you say, what it do? Man, it knocked the wind out of me as a young man. And I'll tell you what, there's somebody, there's somebody, you may not have 15,000 members in a church, you may not be on the mission field just, just running hundreds and hundreds in, a, in, a, in some kind of a church out in the bush country and, and you got a Christian school started. You may not have that, but somebody's already watching you. Right, man. you got influence on somebody. Right. I preach a youth camp over in Georgia and I preached there about three years now. In the second year that I was there, I told this illustration about a, about a rooster. And the kids over there, they don't know no better, but they just love Brother Jerry and think that I'm something special. Right. <laughs> there's just a small group of young people over there, teenagers. They love Brother Jerry. Oh, Brother Jared, would you sign my Bible? Brother Jared, I'd love to hear you preach. Oh, when's Brother Jared coming back? I told this illustration about this rooster and it had, you know, just a big impact on them. And I know we ain't supposed to use that word, but it did. Listen. And them kids, they, they uh, when I went back about three months later to preach, they had all got together and made this little skit up where they, they had these little costumes on like they were roosters and they come through and they did this skit and they said, Brother Jerry, we're going to dedicate this skit to you. We wanted to do this when you was coming and all that. And some of y'all may not like that, and all, you know, in the church house, but I, I thought it was sweet. But listen. But anyway, so they wanted to do something sweet for Brother Jared and we're going to do this. Brother Jared's coming and they worked hard on it. You could tell they worked hard on it, put them costumes together. And when that thing was over with, listen to me now. Listen, I'm headed somewhere, okay? When that thing was over with, I looked down on the floor in front of me and one of the feathers that they had had fallen out. And I picked that feather up and I put that feather in my Bible cup. So now, every time I go in and get one of my pens out of my Bible cover, I see that feather. You say, what does that mean? That just reminds me that there's some kids over in Georgia in this little church that you ain't never heard of. And none of y'all ever heard of it. Just a small little church. Small little independent Baptist work. And they love Brother Jerry. You know what? Every time I see that, I think, you know what? I don't want them kids to get a phone call and their mom and daddy have to set them down and say, Brother Jerry's going to come off the wall, baby. Hey. Brother Jerry ain't working on the wall no more. Hey, why should I come down and the work cease? There's some teenagers somewhere that's got some confidence in Brother Jerry. And I'll tell you what, there's somebody somewhere that's got confidence in you tonight. And if you quit and give up on God, you're going to affect somebody real, real bad. Right. Amen. Amen. So I can't come down. can't come down because there's somebody else that's watching me. can't quit now. can't quit now. <clears throat> Listen, there's an example being set, but also, we ain't even going to read this verse, but in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 3, you find that there was enemies watching. Tell you what, sometimes... I just like to stay in the fight for the Lord yeah. just to spite my enemies. Yeah. I'm serious. I think Dr. Ruffin has been doing that for the last 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> hey, man, I'll tell you what. Yeah, that's, that is one good strategy. Just outlive all of your enemies. Yeah. <laughs> that's what he's done, amen? Yeah. Amen. Brother, you're going to edit this out of the tape. 
<laughs> no, but sometimes, I'm telling you what, you think about there's some enemies watching. This fellow, I was preaching at this church, had been going to church there. There's a church down here, and I've been going to church there for oh, eight or ten months, something like that. I've been preaching to, the, to their young people on Friday nights. Preaching to the young people on Friday nights, and the Lord had done some work in there, saved some of them kids, and all saw the Lord do some things. And, uh, well, I felt like the Lord's just pretty well done with me there. I went and told the pastor, and I stood up and announced it to the church. And by the way, I think that's the right way to leave a church. They just slipping out. You ought to stand up and tell everybody you're leaving. Amen. 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 Brother Jared, that's good preaching. It's good preaching. No, I ain't even got no verse on that, but just don't be a coward. Just stand up and tell them you're leaving. Amen. 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 People pray for you and love on you. You ought to tell them you're leaving. Listen. Stood up, told him, I'm leaving, and the Lord's done with me here, and I'm moving on. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going somewhere. I had no idea where I was going, but I got there. Either. I said, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going somewhere. Well, this guy, he's about 75 or so. He pulled me to the side. He's going to give me some counsel. He talked to me. He said, now listen. He said, now, brother, now I want you to know this. I know that you do some preaching. But I'm trying to let you know right now that you are not qualified to preach. I ain't never been, been divorced. <laughs> I thought now, from what I'm hearing, that's the only way you can get disqualified. Forget <laughs> it says anything else over there. I thought, well, Lord, I ain't even. I thought, well, he, I said, well, now I'm trying to be nice. This guy's a lot older than me. And I said, well, brother, now... I said, now I'm not going to try to be a pastor or assistant pastor or nothing like that. I said, I'm just trying to follow the Lord. I feel like He's leading me in a certain direction. And he said, no, 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 I'm not talking about that. He said, I know you've gotten to preach here and stuff like that. You go places to preach. You're not qualified to preach at all, ever, anywhere. You should be preaching anywhere. <laughs> well, that's pretty harsh, you know. And I said, well, all right. He said, when I look at Titus, and I look at Timothy, I don't see any of those characteristics in you. <laughs> I didn't tell him this, but I thought it. He may see this video. But brother, when you was talking to me, I didn't see none of the characteristics of Paul the Apostle in you either. <laughs> No, but I'm going to get back to that in just a minute. I'm going to come right back to that in just a minute. But listen, hey man, sometimes the enemy is just right amongst you. Yeah. Yeah. Discouragement will come from right in the ranks. Yeah. Sometimes the enemies that are watching you on the outside, the enemies of the gospel, you can't quit because they're really, they're really keeping their eye on you. They appear to be an enemy, but man, they're really interested in what you've got going on. Yeah. Is that right, John Paul? That's right. And John Paul will tell you testimony just a little bit, okay? Y'all right. know Brother John Paul? He came from Brother Matheny's church. Brother Matheny was preaching in a jail. John Paul was up there listening to him preach, and John Paul, a lost man, was making fun of Brother Matheny and laughing and cutting up during service while Brother Matheny was trying to preach. The next thing he know, God got a hold of his heart, and he came to Brother Matheny and said he got saved. Amen. Now he's down here doing Bible study. Hey, what was that? Hey, he was an enemy at one point in time, but if Brother Matheny, what if he would have just said, well, so much for that, I can't even preach. It's idiot up here is just, just making a ruckus and all I did not almost cuss. Listen, this idiot up here is making a ruckus and all that. I might as well just quit. Ain't nobody caring. Ain't nobody paying me no attention. My enemies are just too strong. What he didn't know is that man was watching him. He had his eye on him and he thought that preacher's got something that I need. Yeah, amen. 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 That's why he was rocking it so hard. Yeah. He knew he had something that he needed. You can't quit because there's enemies watching. They're yeah. watching. Listen, I'll tell you another reason that you can't quit. Look over in chapter 2. You can't close your Bible yet. Listen. Chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 20, Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, He will prosper us. Listen, there's no need to quit. Whatever it is that God's called you to do, whatever it is, there's no need to quit because of the enabling. You got an example that you said. You got some enemies that's watching, but there's been an enabler. He said, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. I'll tell you what, when we talk about a man that was disqualified to do what he did, it's Nehemiah. What business did a waiter in the palace have out there trying to build a block wall? 
He didn't have calloused hands. He ain't been to architecture. How do you say that? Arch architecture. Architectural. He ain't been to that school. <laughs> he ain't never learned nothing like that. But he knew God had put it in his heart. Yeah. It was going to be the Lord that enabled him to be able to accomplish that great work. He wasn't trying to do it in the power of the flesh. That's the reason a lot of men drop out of the ministry. I've talked to more than one and said, what was the problem? And they said, I quit praying. Mm -hmm. If you quit praying, you're getting in bad, That's bad right. shape. Amen. Bad shape. I've even talked to men that's told me, I've talked to people that told me, I read my, I had a guy tell me one time, he said, I read my Bible a hundred minutes a day. And I just got down and started crying and you know, put me under conviction, man. I read my Bible a hundred minutes a day, he said, but I bet I don't pray three minutes a day. Oh. Sound like something's off balance somewhere, don't you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's fun, ain't it, handling that sword. That sword practice is fun. A little different when you got to get down and talk to somebody you can't see. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Amen. What are you doing? When you get up and you try to venture off into the day and you haven't bowed down and asked the Lord to help you, there ain't no telling where you're going to be in the next year. Yeah. There's no telling. But he said, it's the Lord that will that, prosper us. He's the one that's going to make us able to do this. I like this. I want to read you this little, this little thing here. Put this down. Y'all probably heard it, but it says, A little brown cork fell in the path of a whale of the ocean, who lashed it down with his angry tail. But in spite of its blows, it quickly arose and floated serenely before his nose. Are y'all with me so far in this big point? Said the cork to the whale, You may flap and sputter and frown. But you never, never can keep me down, for I am made of the stuff that is buoyant enough to float instead of drown. Listen to me. If you've been made a new creature, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Is that not right? Yeah. You've been made of some different stuff. that You ain't got to drown because the Lord's made you of some different stuff that's able just to keep floating on top. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. But we lose sight of that and we start trying to act out in the flesh and do things in the flesh and do the work of God in the flesh and think, man, I'm getting discouraged and I'm not seeing God do anything. The reason is, is because we try to accomplish what we do in the power of the flesh. There's been an enabling by the Lord if we take Him up on it. If we communicate with Him. I want to say this and I'm done, but... Chapter 6, let's look over to chapter 6 and I'll be finished. This is, I didn't mean to preach this long, but just, just stay with me. One more minute, please. Nehemiah chapter 6, the Bible says in verse 16, And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, listen, well, let's look at 15. So the wall was finished in the 20th and 5th day of the month, Elul. I guess that's how you say that, in 50 and 2 days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things. Notice what they said. They were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that the work was wrought of our God. Amen. You can't quit because the end result is to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When that wall was done, nobody got around and clapped their hands for Nehemiah. Nobody clapped their hands for everybody that was involved in the work and recognizing people. When the people saw that the wall was finished, they saw and they said, man, this thing was wrought of our God. Yeah. It's the Lord God that did this work. And the end result of the whole thing, whatever God's called you to do, you stay in there and stick it out, the end result is to try to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's it. That's it. I'll tell you this, when I look back over the past few years and I think about this, and I would, I would love, I've been, I've been preaching, I got away from the Lord one time for about five years, and I've been right now coming up on, well, I guess it's coming up on nine years. And I just want to stay right, but I want to do like Paul. When he said, I, I fought a good fight, yeah, I finished yeah. my course, I kept the faith. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be like Paul. I just want to finish this thing. Yeah, amen. I just want to finish it. Amen. You say, what kind of 
what kind of wall are you going to build? We'd like to see the wall that you're going to build. It won't be much to look at. Huh? It won't be much to look at. But you know what? When people see it, I want them to say, man, the Lord did the work in it. Yeah. 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 When I go back, if that guy lives, and he probably will live just to spite me, but the guy that pulled me aside that night, if he lives another 20 years or so, if our paths ever cross, I'd want him to say, you know what? I never did see Titus. I never did see Timothy and that boy. That boy was, in my eyes, completely disqualified to be doing what he was doing. Completely just an utter failure in my sight. But you know what? I didn't see Titus or Timothy much, but I sure can see the Lord Jesus Christ in that. Yeah. I sure can see the Lord in that. That's what I wanted to say. That's what I wanted to say. Tonight, I'll tell you what. You just dig in. Got another year starting up. I guess some of some people in here's going to school and all that. And if you are, just decide right now if that's the work that God's put in your heart. If that's the good work that God's put in your heart for the next few years, just dig in and just Amen. work till the wall gets finished. Yes. Amen. Just work till it gets finished. And then when God calls you and He says, "All right, I want you to go out and pastor," or "I want you to move up so and so and be somebody's assistant," or go to the mission field. You know what? You just dig in and you just do it again. Amen. You just do it again. Day after day after day, you just keep laying bricks and laying bricks and laying bricks and laying bricks. And then finally one day you'll be like Paul in the walls he finished. And if we did it right, it will bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Okay. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. God, I pray that the Lord did this my little God. Lord, touch somebody's heart tonight. God, that Lord, you might use it to encourage somebody. Father God, I feel like I've done what you wanted me to do tonight. God, I pray that you would use these words. And Father God, that you bless the guys that still supposed to preach. Lord, that you'd uh, Lord, help us have a good time of fellowship here tonight. We thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.